Good morning, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, if you're listening out east. I uh, hope you're having a good one out there this Sunday morning or afternoon, uh, wherever you're listening from. We're broadcasting from Burnaby, British Columbia, and uh, we're on CJSF 90.1 FM, online at www.cjsf.ca, A9.3 Shaw Cable FM, and TELUS HD Channel 3706. Uh, you're listening to Jambalaya with KP Wee. Today we're going to air a special edition of Jambalaya where you will we'll be playing an interview we conducted with Kenyan author, journalist, and writing instructor Adrian Bridge Bassey from earlier this week in the first half of our program. Bridge Bassey discusses his writing life, shares some tips about the holidays in terms of traveling and gift giving, and reads a couple of chapters of his novel in progress as well. So it's a pleasure to have him share that with us on the air. Then in the second half of our show today, we'll have great music from uh, up-and-coming artists as always. But before all of that, we have a few announcements here on CJSF 9.1 FM, and then we'll be back with Adrian Bridge Bassey. Aboriginal culture and adventures. Sometimes we all need to investigate something new and exciting. It could be in our own area or neighborhood. The Aboriginal Tourism Association has different cultural adventures, authentic experience and much more. See totem poles being created, look at some incredible artwork or enjoy different traditional foods. The website has everything you need to plan something new and exciting. For more information, go to aboriginalbc.com. Do you need a break? Have to do something physical, but you can't go to the club. How about join your local parks and recreation center? Activities include skateboard and bike parks, record cards, play fields, will work around one of the city's parks. 30 fitness centers, 9 indoor pools, and 8 ice rinks to choose from. For more information, please go to VancouverParks.ca or your municipal parks and recreation website with Dial 311. A public service announcement. Open your eyes. Open your ears. Open your mind. Bike lanes are becoming more and more common. Motorists need to share the road with cyclists. So check your mirrors, check your blind spots, and pay attention. Stay road safe. Stay alive. Good afternoon, everybody. You're listening to Smitten by the Written on CJSF 90.1 FM in Burnaby, British Columbia, 89.3 Shaw Cable FM, and on the internet at www.cjsf.ca. My name is KP Wee, and I'll be with you today. It's, uh, it's my pleasure to interview author, journalist, and writing instructor Adrian Bridge Bassey, who has had a book as well as several short stories published. He's also written numerous travel articles. Uh, he's taught creative writing here in Vancouver, British Columbia, and uh, these things he's living in the Toronto area and writes about travel. Uh, so Adrian and I will be discussing his life, some of his work, some travel tips, maybe some suggestions on how not to spend so much money on travel and gifts over the holidays, um, and you know, a few other things. And if we have time, Adrian will also be reading a f travel article and perhaps some fiction. So good afternoon, Adrian, and welcome to Written by the Smitten um, on CJSF 9.1 FM. And how are you doing this afternoon? I'm doing well, KP. Thanks for having me, and uh, yeah, happy to join you. Great. I'm excited to have you on today for sure. Uh, let's start by getting to know you a bit better. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into writing. Well, you know, I've always wanted to be a writer since I was a, since I was a little kid, and uh, I went uh, to journalism school at Ryerson uh, uh, and uh, was uh, very interested in becoming a, a sports uh, journalist, and uh, I did do that for a few years. I was uh, an uh, editor and a reporter in uh, New York Newsday, one of the uh, those big bad New York tabloids there for about <laughs> 10 years, and uh, then uh, moved on to... Uh, uh, Vancouver Sun briefly, and uh, ended up now at the Toronto Star, and uh, started uh, my own uh, website with a few colleagues, uh, focused on Canadian travel, it's called vacay.ca, 
and uh, we're very excited about that. We've got a lot of momentum going, and uh, people seem to be real keen on getting uh, more travel tips and travel stories about what to do in, in uh, this, uh, this country. Nice. Uh, now, tell me a little bit about the, um, you know being a, 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 I guess, a sports journalist. Like, what was it like? You know, chasing around athletes and trying to get their stories. Yeah, you, you, you know, as a as a kid, uh, one of the things that uh, for for guys especially that you can really be passionate about is, is, is sports, and uh, uh, you know, not feel. Uh, too strange about <laughs> about showing your real affection for the teams you love and the and the athletes you really cheer for. So, you know, you know, being um, that really hooked in uh, for me uh, uh, the whole sports uh, aspect of it, and and growing up uh, being a Blue Jays fan and witnessing those two uh, for, uh, World Series championships was, was fantastic. And but you know, once I got into the business a little bit, uh, you, you found out that uh, chasing athletes around wasn't uh, it you know wasn't all it was. Uh, <laughs> What, what you might think of uh, <laughs> outside of outside of the locker room, you know, uh, there's some of the, the there is a reputation for this early, uh, the surly encounters now and then, and uh, although you know the, you, you get your great uh, great uh, athletes as well, they're, they're wonderful people, but it, it, there there is a bit of a grind to it, and uh, I also kind of discovered that uh, more than being a, a sports writer, I just wanted to be a, a, a very very good writer, so. Uh, it wasn't until I went to graduate school for creative writing that I really realized that uh, even though I was making a very good living uh, it, as an editor and a, and a writer, I uh, didn't know nearly enough uh, uh, what, uh, of what I needed to be uh, a really polished uh, uh, writer with, uh, uh, creatively and otherwise. Now, uh, also, what I find interesting is that you're also a writing instructor. Um, you know, you've taught classes here in British Columbia before, um, courses such as creative writing, something you were talking about, and even sports fiction. Like, like how did that come about? Uh, well, you, you, trying to hook into uh, both my passions, you know, I think that's uh, what you want to do when you're writing, is to be passionate about uh, whatever subject matter uh, you're dealing with, it, it just leads to uh, stronger prose and being so tied into the sports, being uh, you know such a uh, passionate follower of, of the games, and also uh, my first uh, job at, after university was uh, as a junior hockey reporter uh, in uh, the Ottawa Valley area, and that was happening around the same time the. Uh, Sheldon Kennedy, Graham James, uh, uh, sexual abuse scandal uh, took place. That was back in ninety five, ninety six. Right. And you know that this subject is back in the news now with what's happening at Penn State and Syracuse University. Exactly. It's real interesting to me seeing uh, seeing it come come about again, and and it's the same sort of uh, um, issues that are that are placed that were there 15 years ago and Sheldon Kennedy was on Capitol Hill yesterday telling uh, the U.S. Uh, Congress uh, of what what needs to be done to deal with the sexual abuse uh, issue, which it, that's a big part of what 50 Mission Cap, my novel, is about, is uh, that it deals with that issue of, of molestation and uh, and how we place so much pressure on kids at a very young age and put them in vulnerable, vulnerable positions. Particularly in Canada and hockey, where you know, at 15, 16, uh, kids are out, out of their homes being billeted by families, and uh, there's a uh, you know potential for for danger. Although you know, 99.9% of families are all great, and and people have lifelong friendships with the, their billets, uh, but uh, there are uh, possibilities for. Uh, uh, danger for, for, for young people uh, that arise. That's, that's, yeah, that's absolutely right. I mean, uh, you were just talking about that. Uh, you wrote 50 Mission Cap several years ago, which is, you know, a, a sports fiction uh, novel. I uh, really enjoyed it. Um, uh, it's about like a hockey player fighting to deal with you know, family tragedy and uh, while playing well enough to get a scholarship and help his underdog team overachieve. Um, he, like you mentioned, it's a story that looks at young athletes and you know how much pressure they have to deal with uh, you know in their lives and also the molestation issue as well. Now, what exactly inspired you to write uh, Fifty Mission Cap? 
Uh, well, there, there were a couple things. One, one was my experience as a junior hockey uh, reporter and seeing mm-hmm. this. Uh, there, there's, there's other aspects too that that the book touches on with dealing with uh, players coming in from from Europe for the first time and, and the former uh, Russian Republic uh, back in '95, '96. That that time, mm-hmm. there's a very very dynamic time in the. In junior hockey in Canada, where the communities have to deal now with uh, with these kids coming from from other parts of the world and taking up positions that normally had been designated for for the local kids. So there's there's that aspect too in the book, and the, it, it, I think it was an ex- the inspiration was partly that, partly you know the I'm a big uh, tragically hip fan, and and the, that title of course is from their song about uh, right. El Barilco, uh, uh goal uh, back uh, back in the 50s with the Leafs. And uh, having been in New York when I wrote this book, uh, it, uh, I think most people when they're outside of the country, they'll tell you they're become more patriotic in a way because you, you do miss home and you do kind of reflect a little bit more on and what uh, what you really love about your country. And, and the, those are all sort of things that inspired me to write the book and also just the desire to to uh, complete a, a novel you know it's, uh, it's, uh, it's kind of like running a, running a marathon or a long distance race it's something you, you just want to complete once you once you get that get going at it Good stuff. Well, we're pleased to be chatting with Adrian Bridge Bassey, author, journalist, and writing instructor here on Smitten by the Written on CJSF 9.1 FM. Um, so you've written this novel, uh, 50 Mission Cap, and you've also written sh- short stories. Uh, which do you prefer? Well, it, it, I, mean, uh, I think most writers will tell you they, they love both. I think the, the short story can be more powerful, and in some ways it's more of a challenge because you're, you really have to... Um, it, there's no waste of words, you know. You you, you have to be very uh, very economical with, with uh, how you develop your characters and your and your plot. And it, it's real it's a real challenge to write a, a compelling uh, short story and that uh, resonates with, with uh, readers. Uh, novels, um, it, it, you know, the Clark Blaze was up for the uh, Governor General General's Award. Uh, uh, this uh, year, and uh, or sorry, for the Giller Prize this year, uh, and he was one of my instructors in uh, in graduate school, and, uh, and he wrote um, uh, comparing the novel to the short story that the novel is the volcano exploding, and the <laughs> short story is uh, what happens in the aftermath, and, uh, meaning that the, it's, uh, it's uh, the short story is dealing with uh, with people and and how they handle uh, situations uh, that are uh, you know cha- chaotic to them uh, or uh, uh, visceral to them and the novel is uh, oftentimes dealing with uh, bigger uh, issues uh, more widespread uh, almost cinema- cinematic in a way in, in the scope that it, that it deals with where short stories are very much more intimate in in in, uh, in their subject matter and uh, and their focus on, on characters. So, you know, a really great novel, I think, is, is something that really emulates a short story. And uh, one one book uh, uh, that I always uh, say is is like a uh, a short story expanded um, is uh, the Hours, which was made into uh, an Oscar nominated film a few few years ago. That was uh, Michael Cunningham's book from 1998. Uh, that one appeals surprise, uh, and he, you know that, that that to me reads is a novel that reads like a short story. Good stuff. Um, I mean, these days um, you're writing about travel. I mean, um, you know, you you've done like novels, you've done short stories, like fiction, but uh, now you you write you know about travel. And I mean, you know, talk about a cool gig. I mean, how did you you know get started in in writing about travel? Well, you know, I, I just uh, one day I was uh, sent to Montreal to write a travel story, and, okay. <laughs> and it ended up uh, winning an award. And, uh, oh, nice! And I ended up uh, kind of staying there, and uh, I think uh, it's just one of those things that uh, the travel that the Toronto Star they decided that uh, I would uh, should be in the travel department, and, and <laughs> that worked out that way. But you know, I, I enjoy it because it's. Uh, it, it, of the 
writing a newspaper it's the most creative and it's more uh, I could use some of those uh, narrative skills that I've tried to hone over the years as a creative writer and mm -hmm. use them in in uh, in travel writing because you're dealing with uh, people who you're trying to develop their personalities and get to the the root of who they are and what their culture is like, and also your very descriptive uh, scenes, uh, uh, scene the, of the scenery and uh, and places. Uh, that's a that's a real key to, to good travel writing, and uh, I think those are the sort of things that play to my strengths and the strengths of any any good writer and. Uh, yeah, I think you're, you're you're dealing with trying to make uh, characters out of the people you, you talk to, and mm -hmm. also characters of the, of the of the landscapes themselves. Good stuff. Uh, so we're, we're chatting with Adrian Bridge Bassey, author, journalist, and writing instructor here on CJSF 90.1 FM. I mean, it, s it seems like you know quite a bit about travel uh, because of your expert, your experience, um, you know, in traveling and writing about it. I'm sure our listeners will be interested in knowing, you know, uh, how to not spend so much money on travel over holidays. Um, you know, with the holidays coming up and everything like that. Um, any insights into that, Adrian? I mean, what do I do if I'm traveling in Canada over the holidays but don't want to spend a lot of money? Well, you know, you do have a lot of uh, a lot of places giving discounts and deals uh, for the holidays. And in Toronto, I know uh, the tourism board here has uh, really tried to spur uh, tourism coming into the city in, in December, which traditionally has been uh, one of the weakest or, or the weakest month for, for travel. Uh, uh, Within Toronto, but uh, it's—I I think they're kind of realizing it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, especially when you look at a city like New York, where the busiest time of the year is now, and it's only a couple degrees on average colder than than what Toronto is. So the, there's a lot of uh, deals, packages, deep discounts uh, on hotels, accommodations, and restaurants going on in Toronto right now. Um, Vancouver and British Columbia. I think I think it's. Uh, fairly similar in, in that uh, you can get a lot of uh, bargains uh, around now as uh, people are, are <laughs> heading into the, uh, their holiday shopping season for, for uh, discounts. So uh, I think it kind of applies to any, anything you're buying right now. There's a, there's a lot of deals happening. But, you know, also you don't, uh, I encourage people to, this season to, to give to Kent Charities and, and Keep It Out Org is one that I'm a member of and I've been a fan of for a number of years. They, they uh, lend uh, the members of their site uh, uh, loan money to businesses in, in developing countries, and uh, that uh, can be as low as twenty-five dollars. So you can give a gift certificate to someone uh, who can loan twenty-five dollars to someone in, in Africa who's trying to uh, create uh, artwork for sale or, or has has a shop or uh, that they need a little funding for. And uh, Kiva has a ninety-nine percent uh, loan repayment rate. So that's uh, which is, you know that, that's pretty pretty. Uh, uh, dramatic when you, you you think that there's a level of trust that has to be built up uh, uh, when an adventure like that. So uh, you, you don't have to uh, spend money on commercial products, and um, it's, uh, it's more in the season of giving to actually uh, uh, do something charitable. And, and when you're traveling around the world, you're you're helping local economies, and and there are ways to do that uh, without even uh, going there now. Okay, so the, the key thing is you know looking out for deals, and also um, you know thinking about you know giving to charity or, or you know charity in terms of like uh, um, when you are trying to travel. What was the website again um, that you were referring to? Uh, Kiva dot org. They've been around for um, okay. I think seven years now, and they've donated uh, loaned out uh, two hundred and fifty million dollars uh, plus, and uh, yeah, like I said, ninety nine percent loan repayment rate, and. Uh, yeah, it, uh, I think it, I, it's it's one spot that I that I've um, uh, been involved with, so I, I can recommend that uh, that one. Good stuff. Um, you know, I understand as well, you know, you are quite the expert in um, holiday gifts as well. <laughs> the holidays yeah. also means you know, gift giving in our culture. I mean, personally, I don't celebrate Christmas myself. Uh, my family doesn't either. But, you know, a lot of people here do. And every year we have Christmas parties at work. We all have to bring a gift for a gift exchange. I'm sure a lot of our listeners out there have the same kind of you know, thing at the office or for get-togethers. Right. Every year I have the same dilemma. Like Every year I do the same thing. I bring in like a $10 gift card from on one of those stores, and I give the same thing out at these work parties every year. I mean, yeah. what what can I get for ten bucks? 
<laughs> well, you, you know, you can, it, it's your your own photos, your own travel videos. But okay. I think people uh, love to talk about travel. They love to talk about where they go, where they are going to go. Uh, it's, it's it, that's the great thing about it. It's, uh, it's people are so passionate about it that they're so enthusiastic about where their their trips and and how the places they're going to stay and how they can get the, the most out of their experience and i think sharing that you know sharing uh photos of where you've been whether it's putting them together in a collage or um uh, putting getting a dvd together and my wife and i i think we're going to give uh some gifts of uh uh, the videos that we've uh, taken uh, on our trip, some of them which have been published that are uh, are broadcast, and uh, and get those for some of our family members who are always wanting to know uh, more than what we uh, what we're able to show into the world through our uh, newspapers and, and website articles, and uh, we kind of collate all of that into into something neat for them. So. You know, it's a, the, it's a, it's about putting it in time, but the, it's uh, the cost. You can keep that pretty low, uh, and uh, I think that's a, it's a much more personal gift as well. Right? Excellent ideas. Um, we're speaking with author, journalist, and writing instructor Adrian Bridge Bassey here on CJSF ninety point one FM. Uh, Adrian, do you have any works here that you'd like to share with us on air today? Uh, sure. Do you want? Uh, should we do fiction or should we do a travel story? Uh, it's up to you. Whatever you've got for us. Okay. Um, well, let me uh, read something. Uh, you know, I'm working on a a, a new novel. It's, uh, it's uh, probably be done with it uh, next month. Maybe oh, nice. read the first couple of pages of that. Oh, that will be great. Okay. This is. Uh, Triumph the Lion, and it's uh, also inspired by uh, a trip to Africa on, on an African safari. Mm-hmm. And uh, 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 just uh, start reading it. Uh, Perfect. It's called Triumph the Lion. Shamrock told me to cheer up. It wasn't a command or an ultimatum. There was nowhere else. Just the kind of advice you urge a friend to take when he's acting foolish about a woman or a gambling loss, or, in my case, a job. What Shamrock refused to acknowledge was the fact being around me, him only made my mood worse, no matter how badly he told me to stop with the frown. You need to cheer up, Blue Boy, he said last week, after another work day for him in the sun. He was still breathing heavy, fatigued from an afternoon spent in the jungle, chasing predators in a beast of a vehicle, stampedes through brush, over cliffs, dotted with rocks, down muddy embankments, growling hard so not, not to get stuck. The Land Rover's ticklish ride turns your stomach into an instrument, fiddling with it it so you laugh like a child when the tires wobble over the terrain and send you jetting down one hill and up another. I remembered how Sham would let go a chuckle as he accelerated, shuttling some group of excited, bewildered, and nervous foreigners, Brits, Americans, Aussies mostly, but maybe a Dutch, German, or a Swedish couple. The odd Japanese crew, or perhaps a Canadian, will tell you straight out what you should think of the U.S., Sham races them through the savannah in hopes of getting each one a chance to photograph a kill in the wild. He sometimes told me he hated it. When he said it that night, he put the broad face of his glass to his forehead and let the cool of the ice shaking inside stanch his sweat. The length of his forearm hid from my view those lips of his shaped like sculpted mahogany, soft-looking but also stoic enough to fight back a grin. Every ranger and tracker claimed to despise the job, that he couldn't take another rich twit from Virginia, who thought because he fired a rifle at a spooked deer from behind a tree, he could stand up in a Land Rover for a better photograph of a wildebeest. And the stupidest of them did, into the fact a leopard probably lurched somewhere in the grass, poised to pounce at any sudden movement. Or there might be a crocodile Aussie, who rangers could, would punch out if the lodge's rules of conduct allowed them to, to deliver justice. No one on Sham's team ever flouted the regulations, though. Stunning when you consider that the most callous of the Aussie men would come to Africa and show as much respect for the wildlife and lodge workers as they did for immigrants with brown skin back home. One of Sham's crew saw a tree of them laugh when a kudu got its neck ripped off by a lioness, and Sham himself witnessed the Sydney cider spit at a chameleon just so he could spook it into changing colors for his lens. Should have slapped that one back to the outback, Sham said. The frustrations, no matter how grating, would never stop Sham from safariing. 
not for anything, and definitely not to dice onions, so yanks, and kiwis. Beans and krauts could stuff themselves while regaling over their adventures and the photograph that got away. Sentences I've heard. I've got a Ferrari, damned if I'm not going to upgrade to a shooter with a faster, faster shutter speed. And don't you think this law should train people to teach us about ISO settings? Look at the blur on this picture. If that cheetah was in focus, I'd be on my wall tomorrow. For the amount we're paying, you'd, you'd think they could find people who could instruct us on a camera. I nearly took the manual out of that one, one's camera bag and turned it to the page she should have memorized before walking into Africa like a duchess. Instead, I returned to the kitchen, where I had been unjustly sentenced for three months, forced to watch and listen to more and more guests arrive to not just see a kill, but a celebrity, an animal I made famous in spite of the orders from my boss, and an animal who I was forbidden to see, thanks to my hard time in the lodge's kitchen. Eleven weeks had passed since I last had ventured out on safari, and the urgency to go now felt fierce. So, Sham was right that night. I needed some cheering up, or at least a day of probation for my duties as prep cook, to find out what had happened to Salrock. You need a woman, Sham replied when I mentioned the name of my pet project. This nonsense with the cat, it will give you nightmares. My nightmares never included the lion. Sham wouldn't know that. Prior to the bloody events of those seven days, we never spent moments at night talking about what occurred in the shade of our lives. Although I always wondered, while sitting across from him as the moonlight stared in on us, what his childhood must have been like, growing up on the edge of South Africa amid all the tumult of the place, in a township sick with poverty. Perhaps he witnessed death, murder, maybe rape, hate. My role in Sham's life was never to ask. I was his Ozatui Lai, his Canadian friend who would sit and drink. My function, since the beginning of my time at the Tabish Gilly, remained to laugh about Amir, the lodge's general manager from East London, whose stodginess caused Snickers to escape from the sides of our mouth, or to exchange salty words about the solo women who visited Kruger Park, smelling of sweat and wearing flowing skirts and loose hair, sending sultry gazes towards Sham and the other black men, but mostly towards Sham, or to make fun of those tourists who arrived gung-ho for adventure, but scared fast whenever a vervet monkey squeaked in the night. And when Sham indulged me, we did talk about the lion named Salrock. By growing a big group coming in tomorrow, he said, as we pulled our chairs into the table, inching closer to the liquor an hour or so after we had started. His breathing had slowed, and his shoulders, broad as the branch of a baobab tree, relaxed as he lounged in one of the lodge's leatherback chairs. You'll need my help out there then, don't you think, I said trying whatever angle I could to get my old job back, even for half a day. Anything to see one damn animal, Sham punctuated his criticism with a squeal of air through his pursed lips. It could have passed as a mating call for a bat. I said, anything to get out of the kitchen. Like hell, he retorted. You be just like these tourists, except you've been here near one year already and still go wild-eyed like an owl. I'm not scheduled on Wednesday, I told him. I refilled my glass from the booze we snuck from behind the bar. Switching the Glenfiddich on the shelf of